Blue Reflection is a weird game, but there's something oddly nostalgic about it. Uh, a familiar feeling like fighting evil by moonlight, winning love by daylight, something like... Hinako! Yuzuki! Lime! Blue Reflection is a 2017 game developed by Gust Co. and published by parent company Koei Tecmo, released for the PlayStation 4 and PC in North America and the EU, and additionally on the PlayStation Vita in Japan. This game is a very odd sort of JRPG. Narratively, the game is a blend of Magical Girl and Slice of Life anime elements, backed up with a unique turn-based combat style. The story focuses on our main character Hinako in her day-to-day -day life at school with her peers. Hinako was once an aspiring ballet dancer well on course to be world class when an injury rendered her legs incapable of ever dancing again. As she privately deals with her struggles, she makes friends with two of our other main characters, Lime and Yuzuki. Lime and Yuzuki are new students to the school with a relatively secret past. Early on in the game, Hinako is dealing with a classmate who is wrought with emotion. This emotion completely seems to destroy her classmate's mental well-being, as if she's being possessed or taken over by an evil entity. And it seems that way for a reason, which we will get to shortly. When her classmate's emotional state reaches a critical peak, Hinako finds herself transported to a magical area we come to refer to as the Common. The common is kind of like an imaginary plane. It exists within the mind space of individuals experiencing extreme emotions. And the design of the common is meant to represent exactly what emotion the individual is feeling. While there is only a handful of different designs for the common, you will be visiting it a lot. As you get further into the game and the feelings of your classmates gets more complicated, this will be represented by merging two different designs of the common into one, or in other words, merging two different emotions. While in the common, Hinako transforms into a rather typical yet really good looking magical girl known in this game as a reflector. Also while in the common, she has full use of her legs along with many, many more abilities. Hinako explores the common until she finds a fragment of her classmates emotions. With access to the fragment, Hinako can learn how her classmates are truly feeling without any sort of filter and come up with just the right words to ease their pain. This process will play out several times throughout the game. When Hinako is out of the common, Lime and Yuzuki explain everything that just happened to her, as Yuzu and Lime are also reflectors and have been for a very long time. Once the classmate who was wrought with emotion has their emotions quelled, they are presented a ring by Lime and Yuzuki. These rings are given to reflectors and to everybody who has had their emotions balanced by a reflector, and all those with a ring lend their power to the reflectors in the real world. Yuzu, Lime, and Hinako band together from here on out to solve all the problems of their classmates, balance their emotional fragments, and give them rings so that their power might grow. This is necessary as the school exists at a point in the world that is very sympathetic to a powerful evil. As I stated earlier, classmates wrought with emotion seem to behave as if they are being possessed. Well, that's basically because they kind of are. Powerful forces known as Sephiroth and Sephira feed off of and exacerbate the emotions of the students at this school. When they've acquired enough power from the students, they can invade the real world and become a threat to mankind as a whole. And this will happen from time to time. Hinako is convinced by Lime and Yuzuki that defeating this evil will free her classmates from this heightened mental anguish, and that it will also allow her one wish. Hinako's heart is of course set on seeing her legs healed and being able to dance once again, and with that a wonderful and pretty unique motivation is set up, and her adventure begins. This game is divided into 12 chapters plus some additional interludes. These chapters are mostly spent at the school and are often divided into a few different sections. Early on in the chapter, story-relevant events will happen that will send you around the school and into the common, but the midpoint of a chapter is always occupied by something called a free period. Free period is honestly my biggest issue with the game, as there is far, far too many of them. The side quests on offer in free period may seem optional, and calling it free period certainly would imply that it is, but even free period has a quest requirement to finish. You will need to raise your relationship points to a certain level, as well as your character to a certain level to progress. Since there is no XP system in this game, this is done by partaking in some of the most repetitive and shallow side quests I've ever seen. These are comprised of simply walking around the school solving issues for your classmates that really don't have much depth at all. 
These issues usually revolve around going into the common to kill X amount of enemy or collecting X amount of fragments before leaving. Other quests simply involve talking to your classmates or inviting them out to gain relationship bond points with them. You will need 99 of these by the end of the game. You may have to go out of your way to collect all 99, but they're not really too imposing. Some other quests will have you crafting specific items or using specific attacks in battle. It's all ultimately filler and there is just way too much of it. I get that this is done to more or less maintain the idea that this is a slice of life RPG with a magical girl backstory, but perhaps the slice of life elements really don't lend that well to RPGs or they just weren't utilized well here. I know at the very least the budget and writing really did not allow this to be a great narrative format for this style of game. Having these free periods be a forced, non-optional part of the game really tended to drag it all out much longer than it should have. Normal chapter sections are filled with solving classmates problems that do actually have depth and will actually affect the overarching plot, but there's not too much of a feeling of momentum most of the time. Some of these scenes are really funny or even touching but never really feel very prudent. You'll mostly be pittering away at this kind of task until a boss invades the real world, and these invasions really just happen at kind of random times. I wasn't a huge fan of this, but again, this comes down to a problem with trying to throw a magical girl RPG into a slice of lifestyle narrative. The ideas just aren't that compatible. RPGs need a drive and a nemesis to chase after. In Blue Reflection, you don't really have that. You just have some vague concept for an enemy that you simply wait around for until it shows up. When the school day is over, you can go back home, get in the tub, study for a test, make lunch plans, etc. Most of this stuff seems cool to be included at first, but it becomes apparent quickly how devoid of depth all these instances really are. Still, I recommend doing them as some will occasionally raise stats. The interlude chapters I mentioned earlier are like normal side quests, but they do actually have some depth to the storytelling. There's not much extra to say in regards to these. Outside of the narrative issues, the game is actually pretty rad. Some of the characters that do have depth actually have some pretty touching moments and for the most part they keep the non-free period sections of the game feeling interesting enough to have kept me entertained until the end. Aside from the boss battles, all the combat in the game takes place in the common. And boy, this combat is pretty darn neat, so let's hit on it. Combat is triggered by running into enemies in the common and takes place in its own arena on a separate screen. You only ever get three party members, so get used to seeing our magical girl cuties here. Combat is turn-based and has a time scale very reminiscent of Child of Light. Your party members start on the left side of the scale and the enemies start on the right. The first to the middle gets to attack and time stops during an active turn. To help make sure you go first, you can attack enemies with the square button before engaging in combat to make them start further back on the scale than normal. Special attacks that use MP can have additional knockback effects on the enemy as well, giving you more chances to attack before they can get a turn. Skills are divided into support skills and attack skills that unlock via a rather limited but not too limited stat system. Every time you gain a level, you earn one point to invest in any of these four categories. You can look ahead at a chart in advance to choose which skills you want to chase with your leveling. As stated earlier, there is no XP system, something I found out the hard way by grinding for an hour and getting nowhere. Leveling, so far as I can tell, is controlled by the amount of bonding points you achieve through side quests. Not too many of these skills are that much of a spectacle, but some are really cool. What is awesome, however, is that each skill comes with at least one slot that you can equip a fragment to. Each fragment will have a stat altering effect or buff that when equipped to a skill will activate when that skill is used. I never found too much use for my main attacks on until I equipped fragments to them that allowed them to recover HP and MP every time the attack was used. As the game goes along, the combat will get more and more depth and the focus will shift to the reflect gauge down here. This gauge is pretty easy to fill up using the charge ether command on the battle palette. What you can do with this changes battle entirely. What we discussed so far has just felt like a really nostalgic and gratifying turn-based attack system to me. But with this, we begin to introduce strategy. One of the first things this allows you to do is called overdrive. Using a certain percentage of the meter, you can go into overdrive, which will allow the character using overdrive to take an additional turn. By the end of the game, you can go into triple overdrive. Triple overdrive will allow the character to choose 
four attacks, which is then followed up by all three party members uniting for a fifth ultra powerful attack, and let me tell you, these feel pretty damn badass to use. Once you learn how to use these and support characters, which we'll talk about soon, you can launch nine hit combos on a single turn that can easily make Swiss cheese out of most bosses on standard difficulty. Outside of overdrive, the reflect gauge is also used for defense. Hold right on the D-pad to start guarding when you know the enemy is going to attack. This meter here will charge as your reflect gauge drains. At first I thought this was a damage reduction percentage, but it turns out it's actually a defense efficacy percentage. There's no way to block 100% damage, so don't get too excited. If you don't want to defend and think a slight speed boost can squeeze in an extra attack, you can trade reflect energy for more speed, or even use your reflect energy to recover HP and MP in real time before the next turn occurs. Once all these mechanics are introduced, battle becomes a blast to discover just how much you can do to maximize your chances of winning. All that said, I may have seen the game over screen once or twice at a mid-game boss, but overall, this game was just way too easy on standard difficulty. This is in large part because between battles, your characters immediately recover all HP and MP, meaning every battle you can use all of your biggest attacks and end battle quickly. Regular enemies would have a really hard time getting one up on you. But regardless of all that, something about it just felt undeniably good. The battle system just felt right. It wasn't hard to understand, the UI was amazingly crisp and clean, and the enemies, while very limited in variety much like the common, had some pretty cool designs as well. Boss battles on the other hand, these feel like they're from a totally different game, and it's the best thing. There's only about 5-7 to seven actual bosses in the game, and you will fight each one twice minus the final boss, but holy crap if they aren't the coolest thing both in terms of visual design and combat scenario. These guys are definitely the highlight of the game. All bosses take place in the real world. Due to the amount of energy the bosses emit, it is possible for Hinako and Party to access their power as reflectors, where normally that power was reserved for the common. On top of this, because the bosses are invading the school, you have students there to back you up. Every student you gave a ring to along the way can be used as a support character, which can be chained onto your regular attacks. Each reflector can have for support characters. These bosses do take a fair amount of strategy at least until you unlock Overdrive level 3. Once you have Overdrive level 3, you can chain your 4 Overdrive attacks, the 1 major 3-way attack, and 4 support character attacks all together and lay waste to any boss without hardly getting a scratch. But to get to the point where you can do this and pull it off just feels too badass to feel like it somehow cheapened my experience. And that's about all this game really offered in its, its grand mechanics, but I want to hit on a couple other things before I end this review. First off, I want to say how blown away I was with some of the settings in this game. The use of color, the clarity of the textures, my god, some of these areas in the common especially look incredible. In fact, it was the bright colors and atmospheres in the trailer that got me interested in this game. And that might be kind of a sad thing to say, that games nowadays are so devoid of color, that color is a selling point. Regardless, I, I think a lot of this looked amazing, at least in most places. Some areas had issues with the contrast and lighting being way blown out, which just ended up hiding some of the actual stage designs, and lighting wasn't the only technical issue. The game is sadly optimized like garbage. You will see frame rates so inconsistent that only Life of Black Tiger can make this optimization look good in comparison. This is especially true when Lime summons Mr. Bear into battle and when in cutscenes. Luckily, this game doesn't require much in the way of reflexes, so it doesn't affect too much. Some of the music in this game is incredible, and it was also another selling point of the game for me. But some of it also sounds like it was made in Guitar Pro's realistic sound engine. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it means it sounds bad. Fake. Really fake. Voice acting, while used sparingly, is only in Japanese, and they do a pretty good job, although none of them have very demanding jobs in this instance. There is a place to change costumes, but don't expect to get much use of this. And don't come in here trying to get handsy with the ladies. There are a few scenes in the game that show a bit of skin, but they never come off feeling like they're trying to be that kind of game. The bulk of the lip sync was left up to an algorithm, which, like most things in this game, is far from perfect. Hilariously, this ends up giving ellipses and pauses in dialogue continuous lip flaps.
And the translation. It's clear this game is a budget release, and one of the first places you'll see this in is the translation. It seems they could at least afford a translation, but not a proofreading. From simple things like not being able to decide how to spell allies, to typographical errors and typos, you might find it hard to tell exactly what Jack the characters are trying to tell you. This is obvious from the get-go, when you realize X is mapped to opening the settings menu. Then when you hit X, it just works as a confirm or select button. It's clear due to translation issues, select or confirm got labeled as settings. For anybody who says they want games to just be translated and not brought through the actual localization process, know that this small error is something that would be incredibly rampant in a game that is only translated and not actually localized. Mistakes like this would be so common in fact, you'd probably have a hard time deciphering would ya any of the text is trying to tell you. The very last thing I want to talk about here, and, and no I won't spoil it for you, but it is the plot twist at the end of the game. Towards the end of the game they introduce a plot twist which had all of about four lines of dialogue to reinforce. This plot twist was forced in to give the story's ending the kind of tone the writer wanted, but it comes off as so random and contrived I couldn't help but laugh when I knew damn well it was supposed to be sad. On the M. Night Shyamalan scale that goes from Lady in the Water to The Sixth Sense, this plot twist was Avatar The Last Airbender, which is so low on the chart it actually doesn't even rank. It kind of ruined the entire end of the game for me. In summary, while the combat system was cool and gratifying and made me feel badass, the narrative approach dragged the length of the game through the mud and rewarded you only with one of the worst and most insulting slap in the face plot twists I'd ever seen shoehorned into the end of a game. While I loved the design of many of the areas as well as the music, the free period sections of the game had me seeing them and hearing the music so much they overstayed their welcome. I'm not completely disappointed with my experience as the combat really did feel that good to me and there really was some well written characters, funny scenes and character motivations but the whole thing just didn't end on a good enough note and the slice of life format caused about 70% of the game to be nothing more than repetitive busy work filler with no payoff. Overall, I would say if you're interested in this, wait for a sale, maybe get it on PC for really cheap and hope it doesn't have the same optimization issues. That's all I'm going to say on this video. If this video helped, you know the deal, like, comment, subscribe, I'd love to see this channel grow. You know what, share it with your grandpa, grandpa likes the anime girls too, we all do. If you have any questions, let me know what jat they are. And thanks for settings my, selecting my review in your decision making process. As always guys, thanks for watching. Come on in kitty.